Hello everybody, welcome back to DaVinci Academy's Chapter 7 Unit of Head and Neck. Here we're going to discuss the maxilla and the mandible. So the maxilla and the mandible are very unique shaped bones that pretty much have a, a unique shape all to themselves. So they are very important because they're primary bones for mastication, for phonation, and speaking, as well as breathing. And it's also important because these are the only bones in the whole body that actually have an alveolar process where other bones actually reside in it, which are the teeth. And that's actually classically known as the maxilla and mandible make up what we call, or quote unquote, the jaw. So first we're going to discuss the maxilla. So the maxilla appears to be one fused bone, however it's actually a fusion of two different bones. They're both maxillary bones right here in the midline called at the mid palatal suture. And if for any reason or embryogenesis or fetal development, if this fusion of the maxilla doesn't exist, this is how you end up getting cleft palate, cleft lip injuries or defects. Also, another important aspect of the maxilla is it has what is called the hard palate of the oral cavity. So the oral cavity has two, the hard and soft, and the maxilla is one of the main contributors for the hard palate. So while we're going to talk about the hard palate real quick, we'll also mention that the hard palate is also composed of another portion called the palatine bone right here. So this is the palatine bone, and this here is the maxilla. So when we talk about the maxilla, it's also important to talk about all the foramen that's associated with it. The first one being the incisive foramen. So the incisive foramen is this, this, uh, this communication point right located behind your two front teeth and maxillary central incisors right here. Um, and it's a communication site for both nerves and arteries. So the two nerves are communicating in this incisive foramen include the greater palatine nerve and the nasopalatine nerve. The two arteries that actually communicate and form an anastomosis are the greater palatine artery from the oral cavity with the sphenopalatine artery from the nasal, nasal cavity. The other important maxillary foramen to talk about are the infraorbital foramen. So the infraorbital foramen over here to the right in red is actually uh, a foramen that's located about 6 to 10 millimeters from the, in, from the inferior orbital rim and actually allows for the passageway of the infraorbital vessels. Then you have the posterior superior alveolar canal, your PSA canal, and this is actually a communication entrance point for where the PSA nerve will actually enter into the, the maxilla to provide innervation to the posterior region of the teeth. And this one is important because the PSA actually is a branch that comes off inside the PT fossa, comes back into the infratemporal fossa, and then penetrates, as you can see here, deep into the maxilla itself to provide um, structural support and innervation and blood supply to the posterior teeth of the maxilla. So we talk about the PSA, it's also important to talk about all the other ones. So you have the PSA, you have your MSA, and your, your ASA nerves. So your PSA is what provides majority of innervation to the first, second, and third maxillary molars. So it's, it's these big guys right here. Your middle is the one that provides innervation to your premolars. However, it can actually be absent in some situations and actually have all of its function uh, taken over by the, the ASA, the anterior superior alveolar nerve. The ASA is what provides innervation to the maxillary incisors and the canines. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss the mandible. So the mandible is a very unique L-shaped bone um, that's actually important because it's the only point of articulation in the whole skull. It articulates with the cranium at a point called the temporomandibular joint, the TMJ. It's also important because it contains no bony attachments to the skull and actually can, maintains its continuity its position in the face by all the ligamentous and muscles of mastication support. So it's kind of like the hyoid bone in itself because of how it's kind of suspended in the face, but the difference is the hyoid bone has no articulation, but the mandible does have an articulation point. So we're going to go over the features of the mandible real quick. So you have your condylar head, and this is what articulates at the TMJ. Then you have your coronoid process, and this is where is actually an insertion point for the coronoid process. So the way that I remember, or I try to keep these two points apart, is that the condyle has a D in it, yes, this one does too, but I think of condyle D for being deeper, deeper in the mandible, deeper back in the mandible, and that's how I remember the condyle is where it's, uh, the temporal mandibular joint articulates with. Then you have the condylar neck, which is just the supportive neck that attaches um, the, the lateral pterygoid. You have the ascending ramus or the ramus, this is what houses the condyle, the coronary process, um, but most importantly, it's also on the medial aspect of this portion of the ramus contains the lingula and the mandibular foramen that we'll discuss. Then on the angular ma mandible, this is where you have the attachment for the masseter muscle. And then the body of the mandible, um, it's actually this whole, pretty much this point from, from the ramus all the way front to the mandibular symphysis, which is the midline portion of the body. The body actually has two portions. There's an upper and lower portion. There's the alveolar, which houses the teeth. And then it has the lower portion, which is just the base, where there is no teeth. So we just briefly mentioned, we'll mention here in, de in detail, you have your mandibular foramen or your inferior alveolar canal. 
And this is a channel that actually runs through the course of the mandibular body that contains the inferior alveolar nerves, arteries, and veins. It begins at the mandibular foramen on the medial aspect down here on the right, in, in inferior right image, um, and actually runs the whole length of the mandibular body to where it actually ends up exiting as the mental foramen. So the mental foramen exists, exits on the buccal surface of the mandible below and interproximally between the first and second premolars. So if you just want to go over your naming your teeth real quick, this is your third molar, second molar, first molar, your second premolar, and your first premolar. So right about here is where you would expect to have your mental foramen. So it also contains exit point for the mental nerves, arteries, and veins. So when we talk about the mandibular canal, we have to talk about the inferior alveolar nerve. So the inferior alveolar nerve is important because it's a posterior division off of the mandibular uh, trigeminal CNV3. It exits the mandible, it exits the lower um, infratemporal fossa region into the mandibular foramen and courses through the whole body and innervates the mandibular molars and the premolars. It also gives off two important branches. It gives off the mental branch, which, as you mentioned, gives off all the innervation to the skin on the chin, the lower lip, the labial gingiva, and the mandibular incisors. But it also gives off the incisive branch, which innervates the incisors, the canines, and the premolars, and the labial gingiva. So all in all, inferior alveolar nerve is a very important nerve to know. It's a branch of CNV3. It actually helps with innervation of the teeth, the mandibular molars, and premolars. It actually gives off a branch called the mental and the incisive as well to innervate the distal lower chin in the, in the front um, lower part of the teeth. So I'm going to talk about the temporomandibular joint, the TMJ. So the TMJ is very important because it's often known because it, in certain people can cause clicking, pain, and problems. Um, and it's important because this is where you actually get the articulation of the mandible with the rest of the skull. So when we talk about the TMJ, it has two very important structures. It has the glenoid fossa and it has the articulating disc. So the glenoid fossa actually is located inside the temporal bone itself and it's what is the articulation point for the TMJ with the, with the condyle. The articulating disc is actually a site of attachment for the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Interesting. And then it also has the gingival mo arthroidal joint, which is composed of two aspects. It has a hinging aspect and a, and a gliding aspect. So that's the two functions that it does. The TMJ doesn't just rotate like an elbow or move like a, rotate like a wrist. It actually has two functions. It hinges and it glides. It does both of those. It hinges and glides. And that's important to note. And that's what, and the articulating disc allows for that. And that's important to remember. And also the articulating disc also has a synovial joint. So there's some synovial fluid right immediate to the condyle, help with protection and support. Um, but it does not contain any hyaline cartilage whatsoever. It just contains this um, articular surface of dense fibrous connective tissue. So again, the temporal mandibular joint may seem a little overwhelming or outside the scope of what you're trying to learn, but if you just remember that it has two main components, it has the glenoid fossa and it has the articulating disc. The articulating disc has two functions and two movements. It hinges and it glides. And then that's pretty much what you need to know. So in terms of real quick and the innervation of the TMJ and the vascular of the TMJ, it's any, honestly, any associated structures that run close to it. That's pretty much it. Any structures that run in close proximity to the MTMJ, it's going to provide blood to it and it's going to innervate it. So if you think of anything that runs by it, you know, then you're probably right. That's probably what it's, it's going to help with. So now let's talk about these mandibular ligaments. So the mandibular ligaments are very important for the mandible because they help with passive function. They, they, they help with restricting and limiting excessive movements in the TMJ to help keep the the mandible in a very uniform, predictable position. Um, these ligaments are not elastic, so they really do not hyperextend or hyperflex hyper in any, any way, um, but they can stretch over time, and then that's what causes compromising of, of the TMJ integrity. So the primary ligaments, you have the collateral ligaments, which is, allows the disc to move passively during gliding and hinging. You have your capsule ligament, which helps with resisting that medial, lateral, and inferior forces and helps preventing that, the dislocation. Then you have your temporomandibular ligament, and this is like where the really strong one is. It's the fibers help strengthen and tighten the TMJ so it doesn't get loose over time. And that's composed of two. You have your outer oblique and your inner horizontal. You have your outer oblique, which limits mouth opening, and then you have your inner, inner horizontal. And you just have to remember this because this is probably the most important part of mandibular ligaments with the TMJ is the temporomandibular ligament and just understanding what they do. Outer oblique limits mouth opening, and inner horizontal restricts condyle and disc from moving backwards and protects the lateral pterygoid from overextending. Then you have your accessory ligaments. These are like the more famous ones, the ones that people love to identify in the cadaver lab because they oftentimes get this confused with something like a nerve, like a hypoglossal nerve or things like that. You have your stylomandibular ligament, which attaches, as, a, as you can imagine, from the stylet process to the mandibular ramus and helps with limiting protrusive movements of the mandible. Then you have your sphenomandibular ligament, 
and detaches from pretty much the spine of the sphenoid or the sphenoid bone itself to the lingula on the medial aspect of the ramus. And this also leads to the ramus moving too far downward. So now we're going to go over the muscles of mastication. We've mentioned these in the past, but we're going to mention them again here. So you have four muscles of mastication, and they all contribute to the only bony movement in the face and play a very, very important role in speech, breathing, and of course, chewing with digestion. And all of these are innervated by cranial nerve V3, the mandibular nerve. So here's a little chart. You can go over this again. There's some important hallmarks to take away from this. Again, all of these are innervated by V3, and they do important functions. So again, the ones that have the M in the name are all the ones that are gonna allow you to munch. So help with elevation of the jaw. And the lateral pterichoid is the only one that allows you to do depression of the jaw. So we're gonna go to some clinical pearls. So when we talk about the mid-face and we talk about the max of the mandible, it's hard to get around, especially with trauma, what's called the fort. The fort one, two, and three are different fracture patterns that are happening to the maxilla. Knowing the exact uh, bony processes that are interrupted with this is probably outside the scope of what you need to know. We're just going to briefly mention it. So the fort one fracture, it's a horizontal fracture, as you can see. It goes pretty much right through the nasal septum, through the roots of the teeth and it goes right to the pterygoid plates. But you can actually reproduce this in a clinical setting to actually help with some sort of malocclusion problems with your teeth not lining up. The four two is a pyramidal fracture. This is pretty much looks like a pyramid. If you imagine it, this looks like a pyramid. Kind of looks like a pyramid, right? I mean, use your imagination. You don't need to, again, you don't need to know the different structures that passes through fracture-wise, but just understand what it does. If it goes through a lot of these main components of the mid-vase and even into the lacrimal portion of the bone of the eye, and actually can release the whole mid-face from the rest of the skull. And this actually is, again, you can use this clinically to treat very severe maxillofacial deformities. People like treat your Collins or maxillary hypoplasia, or mandibular hypoplasia, where you need to kind of create a, a mouth that actually works, or at least has some sort of um, usable function. Then you have your forward three, which is a transverse fracture that pretty much goes right through your eyes, goes through your, your, uh, your, the bridge of your nose, and even actually breaks off the frontal zygomatic sutures. And this is actually a complete craniofacial separation of your, of your pretty much your mid face from the rest of your skull. So when we talk about mandibular jaw fractures, again with trauma, it's important that the mandible is actually a very strong bone, but also a very sensitive bone in the fact that it, it doesn't like resisting change. So when you punch someone or you punch someone in the jaw and you, and you injure the jaw for any reason, you're usually going to get two sites of fractures. For example, if you were to injure or fracture the condylar neck, you're going to get an associated fracture. So chondral neck, you're going to get associated fracture most likely on the contralateral um, mandibular body or the TMJ location on this side or that side. So you're going to get two injuries, chondral neck and mandibular body. You get, if you injure the mandibular body, then you can also injure the alveolar sac uh, on the contralateral side. If you injure the coronoid process, remember, this is the coronoid. Um, it's, usually fracture, it's usually rare, but uh, it usually results in a single fracture. And it doesn't really always have that double, that double fracture pattern. And then if you injure the angle of the mandible, right here, you can actually involve injuring the, the socket of the third molars, which is right here. So then we talk about the temporomandibular joint. It's also important to talk about the TMD. This is where people often have that, that pain or that dis, dis, dysfunction in, in the TMJ joint. So they can't chew, they can't move their mouth, it's very painful. It can present in honestly many different ways. You can have myofacial pain, you can have spasms, um, you can have derangement of the TMJ, so the jaw starts locking up on you for, for no reason. Um, it can actually happen where your, your jaw gets dislocated and your mouth opens too wide and it has a hard time or it's painful to click it back in place. Um, you can actually even get certain fracture patterns when the TMJ is dysfunctional. You can actually even injure the facial nerve because it runs in close proximity with a parotid gland here. And of course, you can get arthritis just like any other synovial joint. So many different surgical options this is probably left with people like craniofacial surgeons or oral maxillofacial surgeons, but you can even do things like a TMJ replacement in this joint. So when we talk about um, the teeth, the maxilla mandible, we'll talk about dental extractions and it's kind of its clinical um, significance. Um, so if you extract the maxillary third molar, so again, maxilla is up here, maxilla, and this is your third molar, um, it can actually end up getting dislodged into the IT fossa, the PT fossa, uh, it can go to the lateral pterygoid space, or even the buccal space. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's gonna stay in the mouth, it can actually retract back into one of these potential spaces. If you have extraction of the mandibular teeth, um, or maxillary teeth, you can actually often even injure the maxillary sinus itself. Excuse me, sorry about that. That should be maxillary teeth. You can injure the maxillary sinus, perforate it, and cause some sort of maxillary sinusitis. When you extract the mandibular molars, you can actually damage the inferior ovular nerve and the roots since they may run in close proximity right about here. And then if you extract the mandibular premolars, you can actually even dental, which are the, these are the premolars. 
you can actually damage the mental nervous that's exiting right here, the mental mental foramen. So when we talk about the mandible and we talk about uh, the, the, the teeth, we shall talk about alveolar bone reabsorption. So just like any other thing, when you, when you no longer lose something or use something, you lose it, right? So when you no longer have your teeth to chew, to chew you will lose that alveolar bone. The bone will start to resorb. And what happens is a lot of actually changes will actually appear to happen with the mandible. Um, so the vertical dimension of the face will decrease. The mandible, mandible appears wider and longer. The maxilla will become shorter and narrower. And if you actually think about it, about someone you know or someone you've seen when they have false teeth or they have no teeth, it doesn't it seem like their maxilla is retracted back to their head, but for some reason their mandible has become so much bigger? And that's because of, the, the, of the, the alveolar bone reabsorption that's occurring. And actually what's very often clinically tested is that when you have a significant reabsorption happening, you can actually get this mental frame to actually become almost an you know, ectopic or, or uh, a strange location where the nerves are actually going to come out like this. So what happens is when you put down a false teeth or a dental prosthesis, this actually will ride down right on this mental nerve and actually cause some sort of impingement or actually problems with the mental nerve right, right at that point. And that concludes this chapter on the maxillary mandible. Again, if you have to go back for any reason at all, feel free to go back, rewind, and take a look at anything you need a little bit more help with. Thank you again.